This is the Monday, March 12, 2018 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes for a brand new episode every other Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old towns of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, wet side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis. And this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. This week, our time machine travels back to the Philippines during the Japanese occupation of the Second World War. Once in the South Pacific, we'll bear solemn witness to crimes against women who have been denied justice and compensation for the atrocities they suffered by soldiers committing crimes in the name of the Emperor. Our guide on this journey is M. Evelina Galang, who brings us Lola's House, Filipino Women Living with War. The Imperial Japanese Army kidnapped over 1,000 Filipino women and girls, part of a staggering 400,000 women forced into sex slavery across Asia, a population roughly equal to that of Minneapolis. I paused when I saw that number, and I went and tried to find a city that we could compare it to, because I wanted to let that number sink in for the listeners, and for myself. 400,000. It's not just another statistic. Think about the big house where the University of Michigan plays. Think about filling it with women, emptying it, filling it again, emptying it, filling it two more times. That's 400,000 about. That's the number of women who suffered at the hands of the Japanese army. Each one of those women was a daughter, a sister, a mother, a human being worthy of dignity. Incredibly, and to Japan's shame, to this day their government denies the crimes of its wartime regime, unlike the heirs of their fascist Axis allies in Germany, where denying the Holocaust is a crime. M. Evelina Galang began researching the stories of these women in the 1990s, as 173 Lolas, grannies in the Filipino language, emerged after half a century of shame and silence to demand justice from the Japanese government that had inherited this grim legacy. Our guest is author of several books and editor of Screaming Monkeys, Critiques of Asian American Images. She directs the MFA Creative Writing Program at the University of Miami and is core faculty and board member of VONA, Voices of Our Nation's Arts Foundation. And she wrote the novel Her Wild American Self, which the New York Times Book Review praised and named a notable book. You can find our guest online at mevelinagalong.com and you can follow her on Twitter. Her handle is her wild am self. Okay, now that we have the background on today's book, let's join M. Evelina Galong and see the truth that lies within Lola's house. I'm joined on the line by M. Evelina Galong, author of Lola's House, Filipino Women Living with War. Thank you so much for making the time to chat with the History Author Show. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. When I was pitched Lola's House, it was just the usual, would you be interested in this book? And I really jumped at the chance. The story of these women has been something that stuck with me, I guess, ever since I first started reading about them, usually just a couple of lines in passing. And big dramatic set pieces, things like MacArthur or the dropping of the atom bombs, and you usually don't hear their stories. Women didn't tell these stories at the time. This is fairly recent in our way of thinking. 
So I really felt it was a duty for me to do whatever little thing I could to share these stories of these women that are forced into sex slavery. Whenever I hear that term, comfort women, which you just have to use, it's just the popular term. It's just the one everyone knows. It really grates on me because it's not only deliberately euphemistic, but it's like comfort food, which is a, a kind of a sweet term. It's something that just, it completely covers over the whole thing, pastes over what this is really about. So I wanted to start here by asking you to define what this really meant. What does it mean when a young woman or a girl finds herself snatched by a Japanese soldier during the occupation? What was the dark truth that hides behind that sunny phrase? Well, I think that when you think about who had named the girls, and they were girls, 12 years old, 8 years old, 15 years old, when you think about who named the girls Ianfu or comfort girls, comfort women, um, it was the Japanese soldiers. And it was the military sex slave camps that they created comfort stations for the soldiers. So this idea of comfort had nothing to do with the girls themselves or the women themselves. Um, they were forced into military sex slavery, and the comfort were for these Japanese soldiers. So when I think of the term comfort woman, it's not, it's not a sunny term at all because it's, we're not looking at the comfort of the young women who were taken during that time. It's a name that the Imperial Japanese Army put on the girls for the comfort of their soldiers, and it completely disregards the young women themselves. It dehumanizes them. Sure. You have these terms, which a few times here, you'll have to forgive my pronunciation, I'm sure, but you have these phrases, kura kura, which I doesn't mean anything, right? It's just how they right. talk about them being summoned. But this other phrase, ginamit nila kami, yeah. phonetically, that, yeah. that occurs many times. Right. Ginagamit nila kami. Ginagamit nila kami. They used us. Ginagamit nila kami. And kura kura was this like term that they created for the language that was being screamed at to the young girls. You know, the lawless, when they, when they tell their, their testimony, when they give their testimony, they don't speak Japanese. All they knew was that these men were screaming at them. And so there's like, they, they all seem to adopt this term, kura kura. Uh, which means absolutely nothing, but it was a way of signifying when the soldiers were talking to them. And that second phrase was, they used me, and you right. describe in the book the meaning of that. And it's a exploitation and a use that lasts till today. We look back on the war often very romantically here in the U.S. You look at it even in Europe. I mean, they have reenactments still to this day. Germany has come so far dealing with the Holocaust and are now able to feel they have an alliance with the Jewish state itself. It's amazing. And yet here, this has continued. This is a open sore that just doesn't heal. It seems incredible that it could still be festering in 2017, and yet it is. Why is that? How? How? I guess that's such a big question, but how is that possible that nothing has been done, that they never made amends here? Um, I cannot speak for the government themselves, for the Japanese, and for Shinzo Abe and his cabinet, why they haven't apologized, why they haven't shown the women reparations and a formal apology from the government is beyond me. But, you know, I think about what we've been hearing in the news lately, these starlets who are coming out and talking about Harvey Weinstein and other actors and other producers and other directors. And all of a sudden, everyone's like, hashtag me too. And all the victims are coming out and they're naming the people who have abused them and used them and raped them. And when I hear what's going on now, when I think about the Yadizi girls in Iraq, and I think about the girls who are being raped by the Boko Haram in Nigeria, you know, I realize, I hear the Lola's testimonies. I hear that they are part of a larger continuum where women and girls, no matter what culture you are, no matter the age you are, no matter how sophisticated or what kind of economic backgrounds you come from, there is this common thing that's going on globally, and it's called ignoring the voice of the woman, ignoring the story, ignoring that moment where she comes out and says, somebody has hurt me. Somebody has hurt me. Who is listening? For all these years, the comfort women were silent. For 50 years, they were silent. And they came forward, specifically the women that I worked with, the women of Lila, Filipina, 
which is an acronym for Liga ng Mga Lolang Pilipina, the Filipino grannies, they come forward and they give their testimonies. They relive the experiences every time they give their testimonies, and they repeatedly share their stories because they don't want these things to happen again. And it's so interesting to me. Nobody has been listening. I mean, they came out 50 years after the war, but they have been talking for another 25 years. So they've been talking about the story now for 25 years, and there still hasn't been any recognition, formal recognition from Japan. And I think it's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting that what I'm seeing, what I'm noticing is that this story where a young woman stands up or an older woman stands up and says, many years ago, I was hurt by so-and-so. And you can plug in just about any name from uh, football stars to presidents to ex-presidents to the Japanese soldiers. And they're being accused of hurting these young girls and women. And nobody for all these years has been listening, including, I think, ourselves. I mean, I think that we have to own some of that. Our culture, our, our culture of getting on with it, or I don't, I don't even know why we wouldn't pay attention when a child falls down and is crying and is hurt. We run to the child. We make sure that the kid is okay, right? Mm. And in this case, it's saying maybe there isn't the same kind of value for women and girls, especially during war. It's a weapon of war. It's a strategy that's used. And it occurs to me as you're speaking there that when we have men that suffer, that come out of even a prisoner of war camp, and they talk about what they've suffered, think of Senator John McCain talking about what he suffered in the Hanoi Hilton. We're bothered by it, of course. We're disgusted by it. But the reaction isn't this one of, we can't look at it and we can't relate to it. I don't know what it is. I I can only speak from a man's perspective, of course. So I'm trying to think of what it is about it. And it seems so impossible. And I guess it's such a different culture, especially during World War II. But you look at Japan today, it's a modern nation. It has a pacifist clause in its constitution now that was put on them. And yet we didn't do what Eisenhower did in the Second World War, where there's the marching of the civilians through the concentration camp so that they can see what was done in their name and they can see what their fascist legacy was. And to me, that was always such an incredible moment of foresight because you'd think when you're standing there and you can smell the bodies and you can see the charred remains and these living skeletons that for it to come into your mind that someday people are going to deny this happened if we don't document it would be impossible because it's so real when you're in the midst of it. And with these women, they're dying. They're just like World War II veterans. They're passing from the scene. And so the Japanese government is able to say, well, show me the proof. And you say here in Lola's house, well, the proof is written, literally written, left in scars and, and bruises on their bodies, but also their minds and their stories. And yet we look at them unlike we would somebody who suffered in war on the battlefield and we say, or we allow it to be said to them that, well, that didn't happen. We have to just look away. It's an amazing story. And it's sad to read that their hearts have been broken so many times as it's put to you in the book. Somebody tells you that the Lolas have had their hearts broken. And you wonder about these grandmothers when you meet them for the first time, what they'll be like. And then hearing that as a journalist, You have to go in there and get them to open up that broken heart to you and say, I'm going to tell your story. I'm not going to come and hear what you have to say and then go off and live my life and forget you. How did you go about that first step of getting them to open up to you? Well, it's interesting because when I first went there back in 1998, the intention I had was to get to know them and to find out what their stories are for research that I was doing for a screenplay. And I brought with me five young women, Filipino-American women, to engage with the Lolas, the grannies. And, you know, our intention was just to spend time with them and to understand what they were like today. And we felt like if they wanted to tell us their stories, they would tell us their stories. And there was a moment, seven weeks into the eight weeks that we were there, where they finally tugged at me and said, when are you going to sit us down and interview us? When are you going to let us tell our stories? They wanted to tell their stories. I had the great good fortune of 
being at the right place at the right time with them and really getting to know them on this level of, you know, every day we would do a different activity with the women. We had like dancing days where we like taught each other the tango or whatever the latest like hip hop dance was, or we would have drama days where we would reenact different kinds of skits that would help us get to know one another, language days. We were doing all kinds of things to get to know them. And I think in doing so, we befriended them and really became like their granddaughters to them. And they wanted to tell us the stories and they wanted me to document their stories. So the reason why I went beyond that initial research for a screenplay was because I had befriended them and they wanted to tell their stories. And I felt like knowing what I knew, um, I had to do it. I felt like it was like you talk about duty. I felt like it was my duty to do as I was asked, which is to listen to them, number one, to document the stories, and then to put it out there for other people to read. And in Lola's house, you can read those full transcripts. People can hear their stories in their own words and understand what this was like. They can answer for each one of them this question that I asked initially, which was, what was it like? Where were they? They're they're just living their lives, all kinds of different things where they're snatched and their life is turned into a living hell. As a child of a Filipino mother born here in America, you're able to bridge both of these worlds. You mentioned the language days. Mm -hmm. People may just assume that you're able to go and just blend in and they you're immediately there's not a language barrier. But Mm -hmm. just like that hyphen in Filipino American, you're a bridge between the two worlds. So how did that legacy inform your interest in this story and challenge you as you sought to dive into their stories, understand them? I'm I'm sure you didn't want to stop them, for instance, when they were on a roll and maybe they said some things that you just missed. How did you work about that? What else did you do? Sure. Well, you know, in the household I grew up in, we were raised in Wisconsin, but both my parents were immigrants from the Philippines. They're, they're U.S. citizens now, and they would speak to one another in Tagalog when we were growing up. So there was a way that I had kind of figured things out in context. I had a, an understanding of Tagalog when I went to the Philippines. I never spoke it, but when I was put in the situation where I, I had five young women who were in my charge, and there were times when there was no one there to translate and or to actually just communicate with a driver or someone who was helping us with something, I found the Tagalog coming out of me, literally just like me responding in Tagalog, which surprised me, first of all. <laughs> yeah. um, so so there was, there, I had a working knowledge of it, but also the women told me their stories in more than one occasion in Tagalog. Usually, sometimes they would start in English as they got into the stories, they got into it, they would slip into Tagalog. And then what's really crazy is when they were in the heart of it, really when the most painful parts of the story were happening, they would oftentimes slip into their dialect, their village dialect, which I really did not understand at all. But there's something about the human spirit, you know, when they were telling their stories and they would take my hand and they would guide me to these war wounds. So there was a way that my students and I, who were interviewing them at the time, we did understand what they were saying. There is a human connection there. But I also had them tell the story at least twice. And then I, I looked for their testimonies because several of the women also had filed their cases against the Japanese government and had given testimonies to Japanese attorneys. So there are other forms of their testimonies that I could look at and weigh them against, right? So there were different ways that I could get around that language barrier, but also there was this way that we really started to understand one another. And my Tagalog got a lot better as the years went on, still mixed up a little bit. And they understood that and I understood their English. So there was really a way that we were building relationships with one another. And I was learning their stories and hearing the stories on more than one occasion. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but there's a way that the language really was a part of it's a part of my being, you know, even though it's not something that I speak every day or I can like diagram a sentence for you. I have no idea what the rules of Tagalog are. I just know how to speak it. Isn't that funny? (laughs) Yeah. A little bit like me with Greek. I can relate a little. I'll be surprised when a word will come to me and I'll think, wow, if you'd asked me what was the word for chair or whatever it happens to be at the moment, I would have said, I don't know. But in context, if I, if I heard her, if I just needed to say something to my grandmother, I would say it. And then I would realize that 
I wouldn't have known that I knew it. Right. It's that connection. There's a way that the language lives with you. Yeah. Yeah. That connection that you have there with them. You talk about not just the verbal connection, but the physical connection, them taking your hand sometimes. And as you said, tracing those wounds, you have many photographs in Lola's house with them. And I wanted to choose one and ask you to describe it from your point of view in that moment of the shutter click. You're in front of Lola Benita's store, mm -hmm. and it's also the entrance to her home. You're sitting in her lap almost with a hand around her shoulder. When you look back at these photos, especially as these women pass on, what memories does that bring back for you? This moment is May 11th, 2002 with Lola Benita. What does that bring back for you sitting there with her? Wow. Well, she and I were good friends when we first got there back in 1998, each of the Filipina Americans paired up with one of the Lolas and they became special friends. So she was my special friend sitting there like that. I don't know if you remember my story with her, but we were very close and you can see that physically and sitting before her store. But also the other thing is that I think that that might've been the time when I went back there. No, it was like, it was just before then. Um, it was just before, uh, I think maybe two years later I went back and uh, I had a conversation with her, and she welcomed me into her home, the same home, the, the same sorry, sorry store there. You'd have to go through the sorry, sorry store to get into her living room. She was telling me all kinds of things, and at the end of our conversation, she said, you know, there's a girl who used to come here, and she was tall like you, and she was beautiful like you, and I loved her very much, and I, I just started laughing. I said, Lala are you talking about me? And she said, oh, yeah, it's you, Evelina. It's you. So, you know, she had this whole conversation with me. So that just goes to show, you know, as time went on, they were ailing in different ways. And Lola Benita was starting to lose her memory a little bit, you know, at that time. But she, like, again, just like that connection that happens despite language barriers, you know, she knew she loved me. <laughs> she knew you know, right. and she recognized that. And, that's great. And then she's like, oh, yeah, she's like, you, yeah, that's right. It's you. It's you, Evelina. Right. Yeah, it's me. I don't know if it was her, but one of them says to you, who are you? And you say, you, you know me, you love me. And she says, I know I love you, but who are you? Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. It was very sweet. That's a different one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And that's that connection again. It's it's beyond even something as basic as your name. And yet you have that connection still that you can yeah. see somebody and know that you have that with them. And what a what a unique and special thing for a journalist too to be so close to somebody who's a real piece of history and a real story that has to be told and be able to get to know them so well and have them have a little bit of joy in their life knowing that you mm -hmm. were going to pick up this torch for them and carry it on about telling their stories so that it doesn't just disappear there in their store with them. Mm -hmm. In Lola's house, these stories are there. And I thought if those stories weren't in the book, weren't there in the book, but rather were in Hollywood movies, the former hostages would be embraced with open arms when they were fortunate enough to escape this hell, the ones that were. Mm -hmm. But it's not always the case. Many of them are shunned not just by their community, but by their families. Yet again and again, they've managed to persevere. They repeatedly tell you throughout Lola's house that it's by the grace of God. We've brought up some of the inspiring parts here, the connection that you get with them, this fight for justice. But for listeners who may want to turn away from the book, who may think that it's just a bunch of depressing stories, frankly, Talk about the inspiration that you took once you finished that book, once you were able to stand before them and or stand over them, I guess, since you're taller than, than all of them, right? You were able to stand there and say, yes, I've told your story. Talk about the inspiring part of Lola's house. For me, there was a promise that I made to the Lola's. They asked me to write their stories down. They asked me to document their testimonies. They asked me to help them with their campaign for justice. There are three very clear things that they asked for, which was they wanted a formal apology. They wanted reparations for the crimes that were committed against them. And they wanted to make sure that their stories were a part of history, that we would not allow the Japanese government to erase whatever memories there are of what happened to them. So for me, the book is a fulfillment of that promise. But it's also a testimony to 
a kind of legacy for women and womanhood. You know, it would have been so easy for the Lalas never to say anything to anyone or to just kind of dwell in victimization, but they didn't do that. They took it upon themselves to tell their stories. And it's really important for us to read their stories and to know their stories because part of their mission is to make sure these things never happen again. And it's impossible to make sure these things never happen again if we don't know what happened during that time. So it's been so interesting to me to see them carry out this mission of justice and of thinking about the future, thinking about my daughters, my granddaughters, thinking about young women who they've never met and what it might be like for them should they be a part of war. So for me, it's inspiring because they have shown us that no matter how difficult or how tragic, how painful their stories are, how painful it is to tell their stories, they are actually quite bigger. They're bigger than, than what has happened to them. And they they are honoring themselves and they are honoring women continuing this fight for justice. So to me, this book is a part of what they're trying to do. It's not anywhere near attaining what they're looking for, but it's my way of joining their fight to document their stories, to share them, to talk to people about them and to say, I know it may seem like an awful thing to have to read. And I've had many people tell me that they cry as they read the book, they have to put it down, they have to walk away, but they come back to it. And it's really important to come back to it because if we don't know what's going on in the midst of war to our women and girls, how are we going to protect them? And to me, I think that's so important to know how to protect our, our young people, you know? Yes, and I know how much they care and the inspiration I took from the book. And as I'm listening to your answer, I thought of... The pictures here in Lola's house, I just flipped to one on page 42. If you want to be inspired and if you want to, I don't know, I guess we all need a little bit of a kick in the butt sometimes to get out there and realize we can make a difference and it's not enough just to wring our hands. Look at these grandmothers out there. March 1st, 2002 is this one, protesting and holding up signs and demanding that their truth be heard and that they get their apology and that people don't deny what happened to them, that there's not this denial of what they went through. And so for me, I thought, how can we ever do nothing when there is such courage and strength in them and in their stories that they're willing to go out there and they have people that are still telling them, oh, why are they talking about this? There's one of the Lola's, a woman says to her, oh, well, what, why is she bringing all of her pain out here? And she shoots back at the woman some remark and, and really cuts her down and says, hey, th this is what I went through and this is why I'm telling my story. And you, you didn't go through anything. And they're tough and they're going to make sure that they fight for it when, as you said there, it would have been so easy just to wilt away and not tell the story and be quiet, which is frankly what a lot of people seem to want, just pretend it didn't happen, lock it away in a little box, which as you brought up a couple times, is what we tell women. We don't we don't want to hear about it, I guess, which is right. shameful. Yeah. My guest is M. Evelina Galung, and she's here sharing her book, Lola's House, Filipino Women Living with War. You can find her online at mevelinagalung.com or at her handle, her Wild Am Self on Twitter. Maxine Hong Kingston, author of The Woman Warrior, Memoirs of a Childhood Among Ghosts, writes of the book, quote, Lola's house is the last stand of women who survived the kidnapping and rape that was Japanese Army strategy in World War II. Courageous, aged grandmothers tell their stories and show their wounded bodies to M. Evelina Galung as evidence that these crimes occurred. The phrase that jumps out at me from that is Japanese army strategy. These were indeed state-sponsored atrocities, yet Japan not only steadfastly refuses to acknowledge it, but they have an active campaign. It's just incredible. There was a story in the New York Times, March 18th, 2012, the headline was, Monument in Palisades, New Jersey Irritates Japanese Officials. 
Now, Palisades Park, there's a big Korean American and Korean immigrant population. It's actually great Korean barbecue there that I go to as often as I can. <laughs> and so they put up a monument here to the comfort women. And the Japanese sent a delegation and on the guise of investing in the town, and they were going to give them a bunch of money. And then they throw in, oh, and by the way, if you could get rid of that monument, that would be really good. Incredible. You mentioned things like this in Lola's house. Can you imagine a German delegation coming and saying, please tear down your Holocaust memorial because it bothers us. It makes us lose face and we're, we're offended by it. It didn't happen and try to rewrite history and deny the Holocaust. Four years later, November 18th, 2016, I saw a headline in our local paper that said, Monument Honoring Comfort Women to be Relocated. And I immediately got angry and I thought, my gosh, they caved and they're going to move it. But in fact, they relocated it to a more prominent location, which I thought was exactly what you would want to happen. Make it bigger, make it more prominent. I mentioned Eisenhower doing that, something he took on his, himself as Supreme Allied Commander to make the German civilians face this role of their wartime government. Why did the post-war U.S. make no similar effort to impress upon Japan what their forces did to the Filipinos, especially since, unlike Hitler's victims, people in the Philippines were living in an American territory. They were supposed to be protected by the American flag. And yet, when we had the emperor surrendering, when we had the Japanese warmongers signing their surrender documents on the deck of the USS Missouri, we didn't include the women all across Asia. What was the thinking at the time that the U.S. just forgot these women? I really don't have an answer to that. I mean, <laughs> like, well, <laughs> this is part of me that when I hear you talking about this, you know, like, why didn't the U.S. do something there's a long-standing history, you know, between the U.S. and the Philippines. The U.S. occupied the Philippines for 50 years, and I guess there is not the respect that is due to a nation that has been colonized by, you know, the United States. I can't tell you why. I can talk about, however, fast forward to 2007, when Shinzo Abe in March of 2007 said that there wasn't enough evidence to prove that the women were coerced, you know, the comfort women were coerced. In that year, in response to him, I joined a coalition, House Resolution 121, that coalition, and it was a bill that Congressman Mike Honda was championing, and it had been in markup for a very long time. My students and I went out and really lobbied for this resolution, which was a, a resolution asking Japan to make a formal apology to the comfort women, the 400,000 women that were out there who were survivors. And during that time between March and July, when I worked with people like Annabelle Park, a Washington resident and a filmmaker and activist, we worked to push that bill through Congress. And I was so happy to sit in Congress in July of 2007 and witness a unanimous vote for that resolution, where they did make their plea to Japan to stand up and take responsibility for these war crimes against the women. And that resolution, House Resolution 121, enacted several other kinds of resolutions coming from Canada and Australia, and even for a very short time in the Philippines, where everybody in the world was asking Japan to take responsibility for this war crime. Of course, they never did. They haven't to this day. You know, I really can't answer why our government did not step up and do the right thing when they could have. Can you? What do you <laughs> well, think it is? They, I, know that... I mean, that's a big question. That's a really big question. <laughs> yeah. Well, part of the reason was why a lot of the things that they didn't make the Japanese government own up to was they wanted to turn them, Truman did, quickly against the Soviet Union. And they wanted things like their biological weapons program, which really came to nothing. It was just a lot of torture of innocent Chinese, mostly. So that was part of it, Cold War thinking. And I wonder if just in the fog of all that that happened and knowing the atrocities, I wonder how much they knew. One of the reasons that Truman said he was going to drop the bomb and get a fast end to the war, hopefully, was a land invasion. The Imperial Japanese were threatening to execute all the U.S. POWs. So that was one of the reasons why they did that. So as I said, the 
condition there of men that are held in POW camps and of soldiers and who come home and tell their stories, it's incredible how different it is. And I, I don't know if it was just at the time that they didn't know because nobody asked. They just assumed that they'd been through this thing and, and looked away from them. But it just seems something here that it takes until 2007 where H.R. 121 uses this phrase institutionally victimized for these Lolas and for all the women all across Asia here. Mm -hmm. And it takes that long. I mean, it's great that it was a unanimous vote, which seems incredible in these days when we hear that they sure. can't agree on anything unanimously. But right. well, that was, it just that seems... was during Obama's time. So it was a whole different time. <laughs> You would hope that somebody would have introduced it in any of the previous eight or yeah. however many presidents had come before, right? Well, I think it had been in mock-up for a number of years, okay. and that bill was in the making for a long, long time. And it was just in 2007, was it was the time for it to come home, you know? I think that's what was going on there. But I wanted to say, only recently did the Filipino veterans get their justice from the U.S. government. You know, they served as soldiers in that same war and had suffered the things that U.S. soldiers suffer during war and had needs, and all of that was disregarded for a number of years. Health, medical, things like that, they were disregarded. They had not received any kind of money or reparations or any kind of funding. They were soldiers in the war. And only recently did they finally get their medals from Congress, and they are starting to see some of the money coming back to them that was that should have been due to them long ago for the work that they did during World War II. You would hope that it was something that, that everybody could move forward on. And I know when I talked to Sally Mott Freeman, her book, The Jersey Brothers, about her father and two uncles serving, and one of them is a POW, those Filipino soldiers, the resistance there, they do a ton of work there. They do a ton of work helping these men get out and they suffer a ton of retribution. The civilians and soldiers alike, where the Japanese are going to go and raise a village in punishment for helping escaped Americans and that kind of thing. Right. Also, from our point of view here in the U.S., we can look at Europe and say, okay, we know the difference between the Greek resistance and French, and we know their experience in the war and the Poles, and everybody wants to focus on Hitler. The Nazis are very compelling. Whereas with Japan, most people can look, and I'm sure you've experienced this in your life, they'll say, the Philippines, where is that exactly? That was the, the beginning of the story of the United States with the Philippines. Where is where is this place exactly? And President William McKinley going to a globe to look for it, they say. And people around the country trying to figure out where it right. was. And to be clear, there are Filipino veterans that were fighting in the U.S. Army. There were the guerrillas, right? There were the guerrillas, um, the Hakbalahak, yes. But there were also Filipinos fighting in the U.S. Army who were denied any kind of compensation or health benefits after the war. And it took up until 2017 for them to receive any kind of recognition. Wow. They were on our side. Yeah, U.S. territory. I mean, they were they were our side. And yeah. There's all these high-minded things that people said, some with the best of intentions often, that, hey, we're going to have that flag there. And they legitimately wanted to keep Japan and Germany out. Wearing the uniform, they should certainly have been treated that way all along as full and, and equal soldiers. Sure. I, I understand exactly what you're saying, there, the distinction. Right. You mentioned the uh, Obama administration. Something that happened there was the 2016 agreement between Japan and South Korea. Right. And you mentioned that Secretary of State John Kerry endorsed that. And that that undercut the Lolas. Yeah. Describe that event as we get closer here to the present. Hopefully tomorrow will be the day that Japan finally wakes up and sees the light. But <laughs> since this was just 2016, describe that event and the way that it codified this shell game, which is my phrase, not yours, sure. that the Japanese government has played to avoid responsibility for so long. So there was a so-called agreement between South Korea and Japan that was struck between the leadership. And there was never one statement that came out of that so-called agreement. There were two different statements, one from the Japanese government and one from South Korea. But the basic idea was Japan will apologize to the South Korean comfort women if South Korea makes sure they never bring this topic up again because it will be a done deal. They wanted them to take down the Comfort Women Memorial that was in Seoul and a number of other things. 
So this agreement was a very bizarre agreement. It had nothing to do with the women and it had nothing to do with the apology. In fact, you'll see that in the book, I talk about that video of one of the Korean comfort women who very angry. And she said, why didn't you bring us into this? Why didn't anybody ask us? Are we not the ones you're talking about? You know, so again, this idea of disrespecting women and not listening to the women and not bringing them in on the conversation. So this was never a full on apology because when you say you're sorry, you don't put all these conditions to it. I'm sorry if you never speak about this again. Right. I will pay you if you take down all your monuments. It's just mirroring that conversation we had earlier about the monument in New Jersey. Here, I will give you all this money if you take down that little monument you have there over by the library, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it was never truly an apology. It did not include all the comfort women. It was never real. <laughs> and they didn't go to the people. They didn't go to the women who suffered. This is done no. to the government through an intermediary who's going to get the money and is going to do all these things and make all these agreements in their name. How, Frankly, how dare you say you can never bring this up again? Right. So sorry. You but know. really, it was, they, were trying to, they were trying to kill the story, right? Yeah. They were trying to make sure that it would not be talked about again. They had some kind of weird concept that nobody was noticing them. Yeah. You know, everybody was noticing. And for sure, I think, you know, when, you, when the agreement first happened, you, you might have read the women of Lila Pilipina were actually open to hearing what was going to happen. Like, what's going to happen? Is this going to lead to a serious conversation about apology, reparations, places in, a place in history? And when it became abundantly clear that this was not the case, they were just as angry as the women in Korea. Just as angry. Really, it's a disrespectful action to take upon women who suffered so, so much physically and mentally and emotionally and have never been recognized for the suffering that they've done it was really a disrespectful act on the part of the Japanese government. And quite frankly, I don't know what was going on with the leadership in South Korea when they accepted that. The thing about apologizing is supposed to be contrite, right? It's supposed to be sincere. Right. It's almost as if in a court case, you'll have a settlement and they'll say, but we're not accepting any blame for this, but we'll pay you a hundred grand or whatever it is. But we're not accepting any responsibility because our dresser fell over and killed a bunch of toddlers. That's what this was like. This was a legal maneuver between governments rather than a sincere apology of going and meeting these people. Go there and, and meet these women. You want to see the evidence. Go do what you did. Have the bravery to do that. And it just seems like a, another really dark moment. But we carry on the story here. They, they're they just not going to be stopped, which is a really inspiring part of the book. I, I keep trying to say the inspiring, so right. it just keeps coming up in my head. I, I can't think of another word for it. Yeah. You quote Lola Violetta saying, I could never forget what happened to me. It's still very painful. It's heavy in my heart, unquote. What can you tell us about the importance of all of us sharing these stories so that these women can inspire us to the point where we can read things like them dancing to Abba. You know, hopefully none of us will ever go through these traumatic experience. Hopefully today, as you were mentioning before, people will speak up more now and, and men who are of a predatory bent will think twice before acting on these base impulses. But how can we be inspired in our own lives to overcome trauma to the point where you're dancing with them to Dancing Queen? They don't let it define them. They don't let it squash their chance of happiness. In fact, even looking here at the cover of Lola's house, which has all the women on it, so many of them are smiling. They don't let what happened completely end their lives as much as it would be so easy, I guess, just to lay down and give up. Well, I think that's the greatest lesson I learned from them was exactly that that the experiences that they had, no matter how brutal, no matter how horrific, no matter how much it tore them apart, literally and emotionally, was never going to be bigger than who they were, never going to be their defining moment as much as a reason for them to shine, a reason for them to uh, stand up and go through this process of having been victims and then becoming survivors and then becoming advocates for themselves and for other women, their story is so inspiring because they know they are not what happened to them. They know that they are bigger than that. And they 
felt and they feel a duty to make sure it never happens again. And they will relive telling those stories and those moments for the sake of the future. So I think that's, that is so amazing to see what could have been just complete broken spirit, and that would be the end of the story, really turn into something quite beautiful and quite generous, frankly, you know, generous, a gift for me and for other young women to see what you can do when everything is falling apart or where you can look. You look inside, you look for that courage and that strength inside, and you realize that no matter what people are putting on you, you are bigger than that, you are better than that, and you have that ability to shine. You did absorb a lot of these emotional stories. You had to. This was part of the job here, writing it. To get to that point, you have to first go through those stories. And in Lola's house, I was already formulating this question as I read it. You get to a point where you chuckle at a colleague who asks you how you deal with the trauma of hearing the stories. That's a question that I always ask authors who dig into dark topics, whether it's the Holocaust, whether it's the abuse here of the Lolas, women forced into sex slavery in Asia. You mentioned the tragic case of Iris Chang, the author of The Rape of Nan King, who took her own life. And you cite a piece of advice about holding a rose up between you and the microphone, someone tells you, to try to keep a filter between these women and yourself. How did you maintain that professional detachment from the topic, or did you feel that you were able to swim in it and and didn't carry it around? How did you get that distance? Um, The first time I heard their stories, uh, when I was back there in 1998, I didn't know what I was stepping into. And in those moments, I I just immersed myself in the stories and interviews. And we did 15 of them all in a row in one day. And we cried with the women and we felt everything. And we were really, my student and I, Anna Faye, who was shooting the interviews, we, we were completely immersed. And at the end of the day, when the other girls came, they saw us, they circled us, they just held us. And one of the Lolas came out and said, ah, the stories have entered their bodies. And so when I went back the second time during my Fulbright, I was strategic about it. I had family in the Philippines, so I made sure that I would spend some time with them every week. I'm a spiritual person, so I made sure that I was meditating on a regular basis. I was going to church to mass with my family on a regular basis. I was working out the tension. I was going to the gym or doing my yoga. I made sure that I took care of myself and distanced myself from the women and their stories. When I wasn't with them, I made sure to create some kind of distance to take care of myself. And it seems like almost like a selfish thing to say, but but the, the but the truth of the matter is the stories are with you and they can haunt you and they can get the best of you. And I felt I felt the stories in the way the Lola's probably on some level felt them too. I would have migraines. I would fall fatigue when I got back to the United States and I would work for any length of time. I would just start to get sleepy within an hour or two, which is so unusual because I can sit in front of my computer and work on a novel all weekend long, straight through and not even think anything about it. But in the case of the Lola stories, I was feeling fatigue. So I knew that I had to take care of myself. I knew in order to get through to the other side that I would have to pace myself in a way that we didn't do that the first time. And even still, even still, during that eight months I was there on the Fulbright where I was taking care of myself, making sure I wasn't just giving into my emotions and crying with the women every time they told their stories. At the very end of it, the last interview, within two hours of that, I got really ill. I had fever and just sweats and the stories were in my body. And it was that cathartic moment where I realized I can journal about this. I can write about this. I can write this book. I can rid the stories from my body in much the same way the women release the stories from their bodies by giving their testimonies. I found that I needed to do that. And even in the structure of the book, I couldn't imagine someone having to read 16 rape stories, one after another, kidnapping stories, one after another. So the way the book is structured, it carries some of that narrative of those things that I would do to take care of myself. 
and it sort of nestles their testimonies in between these moments of relief, like these moments that I think of like moments for breathing, for distance, for clarity, so that you can like kind of gather yourself up and walk back into the next testimony. I think self-care was a really important thing that I learned. And it was something that I, I really encouraged anyone who worked on the project with me to also take advantage of or, or to consider. I lost a lot of people uh, who were translating and transcribing for me mm-hmm. those tapes because they just it was just too much for them to take. I have one final question. You write in Lola's house that, quote, their struggles have always been for the future, unquote. You just talked about how you work through this. I didn't think it was selfish at all when you said, because you, you have a goal here. You, you're also still a journalist. You wanted to produce a book. So as we read the book, as thinking human beings, feeling human beings, people who care about history and making sure it's not forgotten, what can listeners do? What can your readers do once they pick up the book and absorb the Lola stories into their bodies to join that struggle, to build that better future that the Lolas care about so much, where we not only achieve justice for the past atrocities against them, but stand against those occurring right now across the globe? Well, in terms of for the women of Lola's house and the other 400,000 comfort women who, who are probably, many of them have passed away now, I think that we continue to educate our youth and ourselves and each other so that their stories are not forgotten, so that what they went through is not in vain. And we take those stories and we use them as a lesson as to how we proceed. You know, how do we handle stories of rape and abuse, whether it's during wartime or in the everyday that we're living now? I think that they are great models, teaching models for how we need to consider a woman or girl who stands up and says, I've been hurt, I have been raped, I have been sexually abused. We need to take them seriously and we begin by listening. That is a very important thing to listen and then to take into account what their needs are and how they need to heal from whatever they've been through. And that's like just on a very, very like everyday in an everyday way. And then I think when we all start to come together and listen and take care of one another and make sure that our young girls and young boys are not abused and hurt in this way, that we take them seriously when they step forward, that maybe we stop the violence. What my hope is, is that these stories are not in vain and that my hope is that we start to hear women and that we stop hurting one another and we stop ignoring one another. In addition to that, you know, I would love to see Japan finally take responsibility, the government take responsibility for these wartime atrocities and to make that formal apology. I'm wondering if they can do it. I'm throwing down a challenge to Japan. (laughs) Can you do that? You know, because it's about looking at one another and realizing that we make mistakes And all we're asking for is for that moment of dignity and clarity where we say, you know, I'm sorry. Hopefully, even if the Lolas aren't able to live to see it, we will see a day when this happens. Germany certainly is continuously facing their legacy from the war. Mm -hmm. Well, M. Evelina Gallung, author of Lola's House, your last name, although I've struggled with the pronunciation, it means respect I learned here from reading Lola's House. We certainly have great respect for you, not only for this great work of journalism, but for the brave Lolas who are still fighting for justice. I hope listeners will want to pick up Lola's house and join the fight so we can hear the true stories of their abuse at the hands of Imperial Japan. And next time we hear a little reader there on the news or something way down below the fold on the 20th page of a newspaper, we see what we can do to stand up against it or write a letter to our congressman, whatever we can do to make our world better so that there won't be Lola's who suffer like this in 100 years from now or 50 years from now. Thank you so much for joining me, and I wish you very good fortune with your very good book. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Again, the book is Lola's House. Filipino women living with war. 
As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there, or even navigate using the Amazon banner on our homepage the next time you purchase anything from Amazon. You go to historyauthor.com, we take it Amazon, and amazon.com gives us a small portion of every dollar you spend at no additional charge in your shopping cart. For just those few extra taps of your finger, you can help us keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual, so we can go back in time and bring you important stories like today's. My sincere thanks to M. Evelina Galong for joining us and for sharing the stories of women caught up in the Japanese Empire's thirst for conquest. Pay her a visit at mevelinagalong.com or visit her on Twitter at herwildamself. And while you're online, why not let us know what you think of the book, The Lolas, and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or Facebook.com slash History Author. Well, that's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for our next all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please take a minute to leave us a review. Until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in 